Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In his immortal comedy of manners, William Congreve wrote, Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. That was over 200 years ago. Have matters changed in the intervening centuries? Judge for yourself in this story, which happens today. Mark, what is it, dear? I thought you were sound asleep. All those pills. Oh, something woke me for the moment. I don't know why I came alive so suddenly. Some alarm bell in me. Which will never ring. You're not going to be alive. What are you doing with that pillow? Playing Othello to your Desdemona, my love. No, Mark. Oh. You can't be serious. It's all just... Oh. Yet oh. I'll not shed your blood, oh. nor scar that whiter skin of yours than snow. Oh. Yet you must die. Oh. Put out the light. Oh. And then put out the light. Oh. If I can quench thee. Oh. Ah. No more moving. Still as the grave. My wife. My wife. Our mystery drama, Hell Hath No Fury, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars William Redfield. and Emily Lawrence. The Wedding of a Decade. The first, a shining light of the classical theater. The second, a new, fresh, and lovely star of the screen who transcended any picture she illuminated. A public romance shared avidly by the fans that ranks with Romeo and Juliet, Eloise and Abelard, Desdemona and Othello, and which is destined to end as tragically. But to start a story, one must have a beginning, not an ending. So, let's go back a few days before Emily Lawrence's sudden and tragic death. Back to a meeting between Emily's half-sister, Elspeth Whitmore, and Mark Stanton. But who the devil... <sighs> All right, doll, you better get your clothes on and be ready to scoot. I'll give you the high sign. Uh... Hand me my gown, will you? Whoever it is, they aren't going to quit. Thanks, baby. Oh, it's you. Where did you get a key, Elspeth? One of the privileges of the family, even a half-sister. Well, come in. Why ring the bell when you have a key? I wanted to give you time to, uh, put your robe on. Uh, <laughs> well, I was just trying to snatch 40 winks. Oh, do I know her? Didn't she used to go under the name of Tiger Tilly, the jungle cat? Funny, very funny. Not to me, or would it be to my sister? Now, get rid of her, Mark. I want to talk to you. I will be in the living room on the phone, my back to the door, pretending your matinee curtain isn't coming down early. But don't think I won't sneak a look at what's your style this month, brother-in-law. B. Elspeth. Anything stirring? Oh, how much? No, no, it's too low. They've got to come up with 700. Well, well, let them stew on it. I'll be back in the office soon. Huh? Oh, wait a sec. Uh, uh no. Uh, no, I was just looking at a would-be rising star. Listen, if there's anything urgent, I'm at my sister's apartment. It's listed under Mark Stanton on the Rolodex, but it's still... My sister's apartment. Bye. Well, Elspeth, to what do I owe this rather surprising early afternoon visit? <laughs> I thought agents were always busy during lunch hours. Well, sorry to disappoint you. We take a breather now and then, don't you ever? What does that mean? Well, didn't I surprise you hard at work? Now, look, Eleanor brought me a... A new treatment she wanted me to see. I'll bet she did. A screen treatment, a script. Okay, Casanova, that's enough banter. 
Are we alone in this joint now? Oh, don't tell me you want to open old books between us. No, this is a new one. We closed the other when you married my sister. Half-sister. Do you have to rub it in? I'm plain flat-chested and no hard hat ever whistled at my legs, but I still have brains. Uh, who needs them when you have Emily's 36, 24, 36, and even the members of the Union League Club look up from the Wall Street Journal when she moves by? Mark, sit down. I'm about to kick your feet from under you. What are you talking about? It's a pity you met me before Emily, isn't it, Mark? And needed me. I beg your pardon. Well, without an agent and one who cared, you were nothing but a stud. If I hadn't nursed and supported you through speech lessons, singing lessons, small parts, and nothing out of town... Now, theater, damn you, I may not have had much education, but I always had talent. Oh, I'll grant you that. But you're lazy. And once you met Emily and knew she had all the looks and all the money, it was time to drop me. But don't forget Emily's money comes from being a film star. And I made her that. Let's forget past history. Mark, since I came back from Europe, I've been going over Emily's financial position. But what right have you to... I happen to be her manager as well as her agent. And I don't like what I see. Emily has never made more in her life. You have never spent more. We have a front to keep up as two reigning stars. Hogwash. You're a successful ham who draws suburban ladies with delusions of culture and dreams of vicarious God knows what to the theater. You make peanuts compared to Emily and spend the kind of money she makes. A temporary loan or two. I have some pictures in the works. Oh, come on, Mark. You couldn't draw flies to a movie theater even in an exploitation film. Huh. So, I have talked it over with Emily. And as uh, Harry Truman used to say, the buck stops here. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm putting Emily on an allowance, enough to take care of her needs. You can handle the apartment and the rest. But no more play money, little boy. And uh, that's only the beginning. The next thing I'm going after is her will, uh, the one that leaves everything to you. If anything should ever happen to my sister, I can think of better causes for her estate to serve than Mark Stanton, the heel of ham. <laughs> In the elevator, all my efforts to stay calm and unruffled meeting Mark again dissipated into thin air. Thank heaven I was alone. My knees turned to water, thinking and dreaming of him as once it had been between us. By the time I reached the ground floor, I knew I needed another session with Madame Erexo. Why do you imagine you can ever fail? You are one of us. I have always thought one of the strongest in the coven. I never have doubts except... except in one area. <laughs> Every Achilles has his vulnerable heel. Every witch her own weakness. We must fight always against the world to hold the true faith. Come, daughter. Let us pray together. Draw the drapes while I light the candles. Now, step within the magic circle with me. Yes. Oh, great Erexo, mother of us all, who crouch in the black shadow of your wings. I conjure thee from the instrument by Lucifer, a prince of darkness, by all the stars which rule by the four elements, that we may obtain by thee the perfect issue of all our desires, which also we seek to perform without evil, without deception. We are answered. I know what I'm doing is right. Will it turn out that way? Will you read the tarot cards for me? I am your sister in Satan. I am at your command. Sit down while I shuffle the cards. You 
know what that means without asking. The king of coins. A sign of ill omen. Was the question asked for yourself? No. I will ask one for myself now. Then cut. The ace of cups. That is a promise of beauty and fertility. For me? Uh, why not? You are young. Uh, scarcely beautiful. Uh, one more question. One only. I'm asking it in my mind. Cut. The card of death. The nine of swords. No. Not my sister. Not my sister. I love you, Emily. I love you, Mark. Oh, now I feel relaxed and hungry. Good, good. Um, Elspeth was around this afternoon. Here? I... Oh, being the big business manager, saying we were spending too much money. <laughs> She's smarter than we are about things like that. Yes, but is she really putting you on a strict allowance? Well, I guess I'll have to go along with her. She says I'm starting to spend more than I make. Now, how is that possible? Maybe you need a new business manager. Oh, nobody would be better than Elspeth. Hmm. Besides, she's got to make a living, too. And who would I get? Well, how about me? Oh, darling, you. You have no idea of the value of money. No, when I'm old and penniless. And if in his infinite mercy the man upstairs saves you from looking at me anymore and snatches you upstairs for himself, Elspeth tells me she'll be my guardian. Well, she does want me to make a new will. And it wouldn't be a bad idea. We're both so stupid about how to handle what we've got. And if anything ever should happen to me... Oh, darling, please, I was only kidding. Let's get off this. No, as long as we got on it, I think Elspeth has the right idea. She'd see you didn't throw it all away. So I agreed. I'm going to remake my will on Monday. Well, now, I've got to wash up, and you go tell the cook to get that dinner on the table. I am famished. Well, that tears it. Elspeth, Emily, one of you has got to go. Now, let's see. Which shall it be? Which can I get away with? <laughs> Charming fellow Mark Stanton. Matinee idol for a limited audience of aging women. His main role, Romeo. Although he has been seen with varying success critically as Orlando, Bassanio, Lysander, all Shakespearean lovers. Interesting casting when you think of it. Or as we learn about him. He might have made a better Claudius of whom his nephew Hamlet said that one may smile and smile again and be a villain. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. A famous epitaph on a child's grave reads, It is so soon that I am done for. I wonder what I was begun for. That might apply to this story of Emily Stanton, or at least the plan that is forming in the mind of her husband, Mark. The problem with murder is not to want to commit it, but how? How to commit it and not be caught? One thing I knew, it would have to be out of the city. And fortunately, we have a place up the Hudson Valley, suitably isolated. Also, by sheer luck... Emily's picture was not shooting that weekend. Oh, what time is it, Mark? Mark? Did you call, m'lady? Oh, what on earth are you doing up at 5.30 in the morning? Uh, bringing the woman I adore beyond reason her orange juice. And coffee's on the way. Oh, you angel. Thanks. Welcome. I'm so tired. I don't know how I'm going to make it to the studio today. I'll call them and tell them you're not well. No, no. Two more days and I have a whole long three-day weekend off. I'll bounce back then. Uh, speaking about the weekend, how about going up to the country? Mm -mm, no, thanks. I want to just slump down here in bed and sleep and rest and 
hold in like a bear for his winter sleep. Oh, but darling, it isn't winter, it's spring. And I want to get up to the house. <sighs> that long drive. Well, you see, I'm worried. You know, I've got the hole dug in the fall. I've got to get that sump pump into the cellar before the spring waters flood us again. You can rest up there just as well. I can rest here and we can get some men to do the job. Oh, where were they last fall when we needed them? Can't we make it next weekend? Well, it um be too late by then, I'm afraid. <sighs> All right, darling. I never can refuse you anything. Everything I do is for you. Have is yours. Except for letting your sister run our lives. Oh, that's just money. Because neither of us know how to handle it. Well, what's it. it for except to buy things? Mm. Mm. Well, we can enjoy them. I mean, I'd feel like a fool having to run to Elspeth for the rent or something. Are you trying to get rid of me? Well, of course not, darling. How could you think a thing like that? <laughs> I don't. So stop talking about it. You'd only have to do that if I was dead, and I don't intend to be. I should hope not. <gasps> Look at the time. Whoop. I've got to shower and dress and get out of here. How about lunch? I can't, sweetie. I have a, a business appointment. In the shower, a moment or two later, I wondered why I hadn't told Mark my lunch was with Elspeth. Then I decided it was better that I hadn't. And I wished I hadn't agreed to drag him up to the country house. <laughs> but he's really so beautiful and so sexy and so persuasive, it's awfully hard to refuse Mark anything. If I'd only known I'd picked the wrong thing to ever refuse him, I'd never have let Elspeth talk me into what she called having more backbone, Emily. You can't give in to everything Mark wants or asks. He's a selfish child. That isn't true, Elspeth. Look, honey, take it from me. I found out the hard way. I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to bring all that up again. Oh, I'd forget it. I've forgotten Mark that way. Plant us two side by side and ask any man to choose. Which way would it go? Well, I'd never have come back from the coast a year ago if I'd known I was going to bust up a romance between you. Emily, we've been over this ground before. You didn't bust up the romance. There wasn't any to bust up except on my side. But Mark needed a good agent, and he got me in more ways than one. So, beneath, period. I'm still sorry it hurts. I, I wish I could make up for it. Well, you can. Two ways. Draw that will making me executrix of your estate and let me budget your dough. <laughs> Seems unfair to Mark. Listen, Emily, I don't want you to get your back up, but I get the word he has gambling debts, and if he thinks he has backing, he could go sky high. Now, just let me put the brakes on, okay? I suppose it's too much to hope that uh, your love for that muscle-bound Greek statue you married isn't letting up any. Mark? What would make you think a thing like that? Oh, I don't know, just uh, an irrational hope, I guess. You still love him, don't you? That isn't the point. I love you, and I'm very concerned about you. What do you mean? I don't know. You, you'd, you'd only laugh at me if I told you. <laughs> it's really funny, isn't it? I mean, uh, the genes. We both come from the same mother, but our fathers were so different. You, blonde, blue-eyed, open, uncomplicated, trusting. And me, dark, brooding, sharp-tongued, much of this world, and and yet not. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> I could never explain that to you in a millennium. But I am a psychic. You mean like those funny cards you used to read and foretelling what's going to happen and things like that? Yes, things like that. Emily, listen to me. This is a dangerous time for you. Be careful. Just be very careful. But I don't know what you mean. I can only see so far. I can only warn you. Just be very careful. Now, you are scary. I you? mean to. Well, it isn't only you. It's just that I... I have the weekend off, and Mark and I are going to the country. Ellie, I really don't want to. I'm scared of the drive. You mean because of Mom and your father? Yes. Emily, how many times have I told you it wasn't your fault? It was in the cards. I was driving when they were killed. And a drunken madman by fatal chance jumped the road divider and forced you off the road. What else could you have done? It was not your fault. I know, but I still have nightmares about it. You're not going to drive, are you? I'll never drive a car again. It's just... 
I'm afraid even to get into one. Now, excuse me for changing the subject, but you have to get back to the set soon. I want you to take a quick run up to my office. Why? Harry is there now. I had him draw up a new will for you, and I think we ought to get it signed right away. Well, I don't know. Mark is sort of hurt. But Emily, if anything ever happens to you, I will take care of him the way he should be. You know you can trust me for that. Emily? Yes? Oh, you had your eyes closed. I thought you were asleep. That's not why my eyes were closed. Oh, darling, come on. We've got to put things behind us. I try. It's just... <gasps> You're in the fast lane. Oh, darling, it's late. I want to get us home. Move over. Move over. Never travel in this lane. All right, all right. I'm sorry. I'll cut right into the next lane as soon as the car behind me passes. Now, please, sweetheart, I want you to relax. Just forget everything this weekend. Just play possum. Play possum. Would I have the nerve to do it? And beyond that, could I really find the how? As the hum of the car soothed both of us, and Emily appeared really to drop off to sleep, other things came to my mind. That damn cellar. Flooding every spring when the surface water unfroze and coming down the hill defeated every trick we tried to keep it out. The sump pump was the only answer. And suddenly, at that moment, although it turned my stomach, there was the answer to my bigger problem. <laughs> You are very early. I know. The coven does not meet until midnight. I had to come. I need a special reading. I have intimations of disaster. You remember our last... One of my gifts is total recall. The last question I asked turned up the nine of swords. I asked about my sister. Oh? Now I want to know how soon, when... That is not always divulged. But let us tell the cards and find out if we can. If you want. If I want? Remember, there is no way of stopping what has been decreed. Has it been a good weekend, darling? Oh, yes. <laughs> I feel so rested, so relaxed. Good. Maybe it's just as well I came... Did you get everything done in the cell you want? Well, yes, I had to do some more digging, make the hole larger, but I have plenty of cement to finish up tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, that's Monday. Right. I thought you could drive down tonight. You know I won't think of ever driving again. All right, darling, all right. I'll drive you in the morning and then drive back up. Now, come on, sweetie. I've taken off the phone so we won't be disturbed. And I'm going to carry you up to bed and tuck you in for the best sleep you've ever had in your life. I was so tired I could hardly keep my eyes open. But some inner alarm, some nonsense voice kept jogging at me to stay awake. Until I thought it's only tension. Foolish to be afraid. I am in my beloved husband's arms. And how safe can I be? Is she still in danger? The nine of swords still threatens. But when? How soon? I cannot tell from the cards. Maybe... Maybe I should call the country. May I use your phone? Of course. What danger can she be in with her husband? Oh, it's a very long drive. You know what those roads are like. Oh, damn... What? A busy signal. Well, at least it means they got there safely. Still. Wait for the mass tonight. Within this circle, more questions are answered than through the cards. Be patient. I'll try. But I can feel death in my bones. Yes, you must die. Put out the light. And then put out the light. If I can quench thee. Mm. Ah. 
No more moving. Still as the grave. My wife. My wife. I must have been mad, Emily, to have killed you. Because I do love you. Only that I love myself more. More money. For the need of it. What have I done? How do I cover it? Of course. The car. An accident. No, no. No. An accident with a car. Into the river. At the devil's elbow. But the body must never be recovered. Then, who could prove anything? The grave is already made. Can I get away with it? Of course I can. I can get away with anything. No! What is it, Elspeth? You interrupt the mass. Eric thought a death has occurred. A death you prophesied. I must leave. Give me permission to leave the magic circle. If the death is accomplished, what can you do? But go, if you must. Well, try it again, operator. Or get me someone who can make the connection if it's out of order. This is a matter of life and death. Shame to waste a car I love. On such a night... Troilus climbed the Athenian walls. <laughs> madness. The whole thing is madness. But there has to be a reason for Emily's death. The car smashing through the guardrail 500 feet to the river below. The car recovered the body never. I will bury that five fathoms deep. And why should anyone question that Emily's body lies cemented in the well of a new sump pump planned over a year ago? So... Goodbye, my favorite car. The die is cast. The adversaries established. A murderer and a witch. By whom is justice best served? Which will prevail? If a woman has loved not wisely but too well, who can best revenge her? The majesty and justice of the law or a kangaroo court beyond and outside the law? I'll return shortly with Act Three. Mark Stanton has deliberately murdered his wife. And he has had what seems to him a very practical means of disposing of body and suspicion. Which may work for normal authority, but possibly not for his sister-in-law. Since he has no idea that she is a modern witch. For the moment, he is involved with simple but furiously necessary occupations. Uh, huh. That looks pretty good. Pump in its well, cellar floor replaced. Who'd ever find Emily or think to look for her here? What? What the devil? 3 a.m. in the morning, who... Damn. Lights are on upstairs. I better answer. Oh, Got to change first. Well, about time. Oh. I always seem to be surprising you in en déshabille. Well, what do you expect at this time of night? All right, come in. That's about the first polite thing you've said to me in months. Oh, let's cut the funny talk. What are you doing up here in the middle of the morning? <laughs> An interesting phrase. Shouldn't it be the middle of the night? All right, all right. Let's bury the New York smart talk. What do you want? To see my sister. She isn't here. Oh, why not? <sighs> she had a five o'clock call on location for sunrise shots. So she decided to drive back last night and have the limousine take her on location this morning. What made you take a two-hour drive out here at this time of night? I'll tell you half of it. I was scared, if that means anything to you. Well, it doesn't. What's the other half? I won't tell you that yet. 
Although someday you just might have to learn. I won't even pretend to understand that. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm I'm Mark Stanton. What? Where? No, no, never mind all that. How is she? No, I'll be right down there. What was that? Emily. Her car went out of control at, at Devil's Elbow. Oh, no. She went through the guardrail, plunged 500 feet down into the river. The, the car's a total wreck. Never mind the car. What about Emily? I... Well, they haven't found her yet. The car windows were open. If she got swept down the river and into the lake, they may never find her. You mean... She's dead. You... You don't have to... And what else? A plunge like that? The, the car totaled? What else is there to think? Nothing. Emily is dead. What? That's a strange way to... Oh, Elspeth, I'm sorry. This must be terrible for you, too. It is terrible for me. But not too... Huh? What does that mean? I mean you killed her. How could you... Think a thing like that? I don't think. I know. But it isn't going to do you any good. It was all for nothing. I don't know what you mean. You will. When I'm ready to tell you. Right now, let's go to the scene of the... What should we call it, Mark? Let's just say... The tragedy. Okay, boys, use the crowbars. Get those doors open. Go over the inside. Check the ignition key, huh? Oh. Uh... Mr. Stanton? Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm Mrs. Stanton's sister. I do, ma'am. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry about this. My wife, you... You think she's dead? What can I say? A fall like that, and, and, um, and... And what? Well, ma'am, this here shoe. One of my men found its mate washed ashore just before the river empties into Lake Cahokawa. Right down near where the car landed in the river, we found your sister's pocketbook. It don't look good. Can't her body be recovered from the lake? We'll try, but that lake bottom is soft mud or whatever you want to call it from all the leaves the trees have been dropping for millions of years. It's like, like a quicksand. Nobody who ever drowned in that lake ever was seen again. Oh, my God. Look, uh, why don't you go on home, Mr. Stanton, and take, Miss, uh, take your sister-in-law with you. As soon as I'm finished up here, I'll drive up. There are some questions I'll have to ask. But what do you mean, was Emily exceptionally tall? Well, for a woman, I meant. Actually, my sister was quite small. Two inches shorter than I am. And I'm only 5'4". Well, all right, yes, Emily was quite tiny. But what difference does that make? The driver's seat was adjusted for somebody as tall as, well, say you, sir. Oh, well, it could have been knocked back in the crash, couldn't it? Yes, sir. It could. Uh, was your wife wearing gloves when she left? Gloves? I... Why? Driver's wheel had no fingerprints on it. I just wondered. Oh, yes, yes. Now I remember. Yes, uh, I think... Yeah, yes, she did have gloves. You drive with gloves, Mr. Stanton? Well, yes, yes. Usually, and the uh, car is on constant maintenance at the garage. Yes, sir. All right, just one more question for now. Were you alone in the house when the accident happened? Oh, I suppose I must have been. Well, I was just wondering if your sister-in-law was also here. I... I arrived shortly before Emily left. I had planned to drive her into town this morning. We had some business to discuss, but when she insisted on leaving last night, I was just too tired to make the trip, and I had brought Mark a new script. Since Emily was taking Mark's car, I decided to stay, let him read the script, and we could drive in tomorrow discussing it and return it on time. Uh, well, I guess that closes things up for me. Sorry to have taken so much time. My condolences, Mr. Stanton. I, 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 I hope we can find your wife. He is just as certain of it as I am. You murdered Emily. What are you saying? The truth. If you believe that, 
Why did you alibi me? I wanted to spike the sergeant's suspicions, at least temporarily. What are you up to? Uh, at the moment, not very much. I want to sleep on all of this. Oh, by the way, don't entertain any ideas of getting rid of me. You see, brother-in-law, dear, I happen to be exactly what you think of me. A witch. Only I am a real one. And because I am what I am, I can feel her presence in this house. If I told the police what I know, they'd search it from top to bottom. <laughs> because of someone who claims to have ESP, they'd write you off as a nut. Mark, you haven't a leg to stand on. On Wednesday, last Wednesday when we had lunch, I arranged for Emily to change her will. It was finalized before you drove up here Friday. I am executrix and control every penny. <sighs> I'm too tired to talk about it now. After I've slept on it, I'll decide your future. I suggest you get some rest to prepare for it. I wouldn't have bet a plugged nickel I could get any sleep out of what was left of the night. But a bottle of brandy and sheer emotional exhaustion from fright put me to sleep in the library chair. The last thing I remember was a whirling confusion of surrealistic plots for disposing of Elspeth. I even finally believed what I'd always thought of her. That she was a witch. I was sick with grief and desperately tired. But I couldn't go to sleep. Every time my eyes closed, I seemed to hear a voice. I couldn't stand it any longer. I got up, went downstairs. I saw Mark passed out in the library, a brandy bottle in his hand. And the voice was closer. The voice threw me to the cellar. And there, beside the furnace, I knew it at last. The fresh cement. Still drying, beautifully blended and tapered into the old surface. Now I knew where my sister was. Now I knew exactly what I had to do. I now pronounce you, Elspeth Garrick Whitmore, and you, Mark Blaine Stanton, man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Home sweet home. So, you got me at last, Elspeth. That's right, Mark. My dear husband. And no way out for you. One word from me and Sergeant Harkness would dig up that cellar and you'd spend the best part of your life in jail for murder. I'm grateful to you, of course. But some things I... I still don't understand. Oh, you will. Happy, darling. Just give your bride a few minutes to slip into something fetching, and we'll start to begin our married life. I promise you'll find me all I told you I really am. Bewitching. I damned her under my breath for what she claimed to be. I found a longing ache for Emily and what she'd been to me. I seethed at being emasculated, at having to act like a pet poodle at the hopelessness of my situation. I dreamed of the thousandth plot to get rid of Elspeth. Oh, an idle dream. I'd gotten away with it once, never again. And then, she called me into the bedroom. Come, lover boy. Oh, oh good Lord. No. <laughs> You didn't really believe I was a witch, did you? You're not Elspeth. You're... You're Emily. I've borrowed her aspect. Does it please you? Yes, I... I, I love you. I, I want you. Oh, Emily, my beloved. Elspeth, Mark, not Emily. Only her aspect, which you will live with every moment we're at home. Oh. But you will not touch me, either as myself... Or my sister you killed. I... I don't understand. I want to be sure you can't get away with it. 
A good lawyer, your own natural charm, a long, bitter trial, the possibility of escape. And even if they found you guilty, there is no death penalty, so my way's better. No money. No freedom. And the remembrance every day of the crime you committed. The girl you murdered to haunt you fresh and lovely while you grow old and forgotten. This is your cell, Mark. Plush-lined, perhaps, but more confining than anything state or government could devise. And I am your jailer. Watching you die a little day by day, year by year. I've read it in your cards, traced it in your horoscope. You will have a long hell on earth before the spirit I worship welcomes you to the real hell fraternity. This is my revenge for my sister and for myself. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and ever shall be. Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell no fury like a woman scorned. For this story, there is no ending. A man bought only what he deserved. I'll be back shortly. For a while, Mark Stanton's matinee ladies wondered about his abrupt retirement. But the Gorgon who guarded him fiercely finally discouraged their attentions. Not Elspeth alone. His good looks began to fade strangely, till by the time he was 35, his haunted, gaunt face and emaciated body looked more like a man in his 70s. He eventually was committed to a state institution for the insane and died there without even an obituary to mark his passing. Mysteriously and suddenly, Elspeth died on the same day. Our cast included William Redfield, Patricia Wheel, Terry Keene, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>